Hey everybody, absolutely stunning news over here this week. We have a video version of this week's episode available on our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash late night. Go over there, sign up at any tier, and you'll have access to it. Once again, that's patreon.com slash late night. Now, enjoy the show. Have either of you like had gum lately? Yes, oh. actually. But why? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause I was like, you know, I'll get some gum. I'll get back into the gum culture. I'll pretend that I'm like in middle school. Yeah. Get back into the gum game. <laughs> yeah. to chew five gum. <laughs> <laughs> what is gum culture? It's a thriving subculture. It comes in really hot and then it just tapers off into nothing. Oh, like that zebra stripe gum. <laughs> exactly. This is exactly where I was going with this because after chewing gum for the first time in years and years, in my memory, gum seems so much better. And then you chew it and it's like five seconds of, okay, yeah. And then 20 minutes of, uh, why? Mm. I'm trying to not eat as much based on the fact that I eat all the time, constantly, whenever food is available. Uh, and so instead of trying to get around that to like trick my brain, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have this little like gum, like just a cup of gum, essentially just on my desk at oh, all wow. times. Just to, like anytime I get a craving, I'm just like, no, it's fine. Like the little chiclet kind of gums? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, like little itty bitty guys. And there was one day like last week or it was like four in the afternoon. And I realized my jaw was tired and I was just chewing essentially a ball of flavorless putty. <laughs> but, oh my God. You know, I wasn't just eating almonds by the handful. So I guess that's something. <laughs> you know what I used to do? And tell me if this is weird, which it definitely is. I used to chew on tissues. <laughs> I used to take a Kleenex. I was probably, I don't know, 10 or so when I would do this and just put it in my mouth and just chew on it over and over and over. And I haven't done this for, for years and years and years. At the time, I would be constantly picking pieces of paper out of my mouth. I wasn't like <laughs> swallowing it. I was just like chewing on tissues. No, because it would be too weird. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to cross a line, you know? And it wasn't like pica or something like that. You know, I wasn't just constantly eating shit. But just something in my brain was like, yeah, fucking chew on tissues, dude. Let's break it down. Did you guys have a box of tissues? And we're like, all right, let's go. Snack time. Oh, speaking of gum culture, my mother was part of <laughs> tissue culture where we had <laughs> boxes of tissues everywhere around the house. Ooh. Like, and they were constantly being replenished. Every room had like a couple of boxes of Kleenex. That sounds nice. Yeah. You know what? It is great. And one of the things to me that makes a house a home is having tissues available so that if you need a tissue, you don't have to go to the bathroom and use toilet paper instead. Like if you need to blow your nose, if you can just reach over and grab a tissue and blow your nose, you are living the fucking life. If you're constantly five feet away from any tissue source, you're doing it right. So that's exactly right. But you also have to have the ratio of trash can to tissue of like, Ooh. as a person who's a bit of a pack rat and a generally a messy person, being like, you can have multiple waste baskets and your life will be easier and you'll stop simply setting trash on a surface, you idiot. Correct. Clearly, this is how it started. Little baby Brian used that tissue, no garbage nearby. Guess what? Mouth hole kind of like a garbage can. Oh, and wow. Thus, a super villain was born. <laughs> by the way, by the way, I do want to be clear about this. These were not used I, tissues. I, I, These were not. Okay. And I should have been clear, and that's on me. These were, quote unquote, clean tissues. Because I'm sure someone is thinking this. I did not blow my nose and be like, dinner time. You know. <laughs> I want to dunk on you for that. But now you realize how rad it is. Yeah, because it just sounds so cool when you say yeah. it. To this day, I still bite my fingernails. And like when you really break that down, that is a disgusting, horrible habit. And like, uh -huh. bless their hearts. My parents tried. I remember, I don't know how old I was, but they brought home some product that was just simply called thumb. It almost looked like a, a little <laughs> nail polish. It's just a box full of thumbs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and what you would do is you would unscrew it and you would brush on this clear substance onto your fingernails and it was supposed to be like spicy, like deterrent, don't chew on this. Mm -hmm. 
And I was like, pepper flavor, okay. Like, it absolutely <laughs> did not work at all. It was delicious. I was like, oh, there's a variety pack now. Gross. I was a nasty boy and continue to be a nasty man. Wow. I also, like, lifelong nail biter. A couple of weeks ago, I was Googling, like, why bite nails feel so good? Why so satisfying? Because it is. And the more that you don't do it, the more that you're like, oh, this is going to be really good if I do it, though, because they're longer. Like, it feels mm-hmm. so disgusting, but, man, but it's such an anxiety. Say, like the flip side of that is when you don't bite them, if you get a really good clip, that's a sweet feeling right there. When you don't bite them and they're nice and firm, and then you, you clip them, and it's like, oh, yeah, I'm really maintaining myself now. We're back at, like, proximity to Kleenex topic again, because now that I think about it, if I had just, like, a fingernail clip holster... Like I was some like John Wayne for fingernails. Cause yeah, it's just like, I see them getting long. I'm like, well, something needs to happen with that immediately <laughs> is what yep. my brain says. Yeah. I'm going to counter with, I literally have a little dish on my desk that I keep nail clippers in. And do I still bite my nails? Absolutely. Yes. Mm. Right. Mm. It's a true curse. Yeah. For me, fingernails, it always seems like they're fine. And then one day it's like, oh God, these are too long in physics we would call a step function where it's like one thing and then it goes like that (laughs) you go from being a normal person to nosferatu in like a two-hour period (laughs) yeah my nail idol nosferatu in theory nosferatu sounds great and then in practice it's like i'm sitting inside all day how are my hands why is it like this dear god what have i done but back to the tissues and how delicious they are (laughs) yes I'm, i'm really chewing, so to speak, of all of the disposable paper products you use to clean things up. Kleenex feel like the worst that you could put in your mouth because it would dissolve like tissue paper. The cotton candy of paper materials. (laughs) Exactly. You know what? They don't though. Now, to be fair, the data I'm using is from 30 plus years ago. So maybe this is no longer true. That's a good point. Do you have any Kleenex nearby, Brian? (laughs) You know what? In my personal space here, I don't. Damn it. The old formula Damn was it. extra chewy. I can go get some. <laughs> I think you should. And you know what? This is a Brian Weck promise. By the end of this episode, I will chew on another Kleenex. How was that podcast episode with Miles? Oh, it was good. He came on and demanded that Brian eat Kleenex <laughs> in the first five minutes. <laughs> and Brian was like, yeah, cool. I'll do that. Brian was like, finally an excuse. (laughs) It's like the kid in the lunchroom as a child. I'll give you a nickel to eat this disgusting thing I found on the ground. That's Brian. Oh, dude. Actually, I was thinking about the school lunchroom question for all of you. Now, we all grew up in different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. Does every lunchroom have shitty square pizza with French fries day? Oh, we didn't have French fries, but yeah. it wasn't square. But it was if you were to take a pizza that had the consistency of cardboard, uh-huh. and then it was like an unnaturally long triangle with like a nub end. Yes! A nub end? At no point was this thing like a circle. Yeah, okay, Do you know what I'm talking about, right? Yes, because what I think it is is that it's like a long rectangular thing, and they don't have to worry about getting the points because they're doing like a sawtooth pattern on it. Oh. Because it's not a circle, it isn't going to end in a point. And it had like the little perforations on the bottom of the pizza, yes. right? Like little holes. Oh, they're using every inch of that big oven. Yeah, and we did not get French fries ever. Yeah. Like, that was not a oh. thing. Whenever they had school lunch pizza, which, which was clearly cooked in like a cookie sheet, you know, like a rectangular pan or something, mm-hmm. yeah. it was always rectangular and was cut into rectangles. It would always come with French fries dumped on top of it. Oh so you would get the pizza with like a couple slices or a couple, you know, squares of pizza or rectangles of pizza with the French fries, like some real soggy little guys oh, too, like not yeah. good French fries, like wet. We talking crinkle cut, steak. Oh. Give me the dimensions of these fries. So they look like McDonald's fries, that shape, like the pale yellow. Again, in physics, we would call these roughly parallelopipeds, three-dimensional. They're not crinkle cut. They're not curly. Curly fries, by the way, curly fries didn't exist in the 80s. And it's important that you young people remember this. We understand your hardship. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And so these are like, imagine the worst possible version of a McDonald's fry. Undersalted. I don't think these had any salt on them. So a McDonald's fry, like... That's been sitting for 20 minutes. I I mean an In-N-Out fry. Oh, shit. Ooh, no, I'm with you. In-N-Out fries are trash. They're horrible. They're just bad. They're just plain bad. In-N-Out burger, it's fine. I have no qualms with you, In-N-Out burger. It's good. But your fry game is sad. Discuss what a burger. 
Oh, man. I've never been to one. I hear some people say they're just awful and other people love them. Okay. So it's good that you say that. I grew up with Whataburger near and dear to my heart. Whataburger is a Southern fast food chain that just has like fuck off big hamburgers. Like I'm not talking like thick, like a nice hamburger. It's just like big wide bun, big wide patty. Like if you order a large soda, it's the equivalent of like, Hey kid, here's a pail. You have five minutes to dive into the vat of soda and just (laughs) gather as much as you want. Like just no one needs this amount of food at all. And as a kid, I really liked it. It was great. You would get out of high school, go down the street, grab a Whataburger. It was awesome. As I've grown older now, I have come to realize that the problem with Whataburger is a lack of consistency. Oh. Now, you used a McDonald's fry as an example earlier because everyone knows what a McDonald's fry looks and tastes like. Like you could go to yes. Japan, you know what that McDonald's fry is going to be like. That's right. Whataburger, there's good Whataburgers and bad Whataburgers. And when you live in a city for a while, you kind of go, you go, oh, don't go to the one on 51st. Their fries are always crap. They, it's a sloppy assembly. Like you don't want to do it. Oh, the one down on Congress, drowning in mustard. Don't even do it. I don't know who they gave the mustard gun, but they need to have that (laughs) license revoked. And that's the problem with Whataburger is there is no like hive mind Whataburger burger. It's a total gamble every time you go. And I've had some Whataburger that's just like, you know, you're out late. It's the thing that's open 24 hours. So you sit down in your little booth and you just go to town. You get a vanilla shake because fuck it. Maybe you're in your mid twenties and your metabolism (laughs) can still do whatever it wants at that point. Yes. And then there's other times where I'm just like, I would have rather had nothing. (laughs) It really runs the gamut all up and down the board. That's going to be their new slogan. I would rather have had nothing. It's the Russian roulette of fast food, in my opinion. Oh, Mm. wow. Okay, that explains a lot. Since we're talking about like fast food consistency and ranking ripoff doughboys, so to speak, best burger, best nuggets, discuss. I'm going to be that guy. I don't do fast food that much. All right, go die. Sorry, I don't mean that. (laughs) (laughs) I'm the guy who refuses to eat at McDonald's unless it's like the actual only place around. Rachel loves it. But I won't go. The fast food I get is In-N-Out and occasionally because they serve ice cream, Wiener Schnitzel. I've never been to a Wiener Schnitzel. They're all over here, all over the place here. And we didn't have one on the East Coast. Hot dog place? Yep, hot dog place. And they serve little like soft serve cones and the equivalent of a blizzard, which they call a freezy, which is the fucking worst name for anything <laughs> like that imaginable. So my experience with fast food recently is In-N-Out and ice cream at Wiener Schnitzel, and that's all I can talk about. Quick Wiener tangent. Now I'm listening. (laughs) Now you have my attention. So I have a complicated relationship with hot dogs, and I want to just get ahead of this and say this. I love hot dogs. When I was a kid, that was like my after-school snack, which also like I'm mortified at the things that I would put away as a snack before my parents made dinner. Oh, of course, yes. I would eat hot dogs just like by the sleeve. If they came in sleeves, I'd eat them by it. And so now I feel like unless I'm getting either a like gourmet fancy hot dog at some like, you know, niche like, oh, you got to go to Frank. They have a hot dog. They have the hot dog escalator. Sadly closed down. R.I.P. Frank. It did? It did. Oh, no. Super sad about it. I know. Yeah. But it's either that or if I'm at some sort of sporting event, I'm like, yes. Give me the foil hot dog. I will put it in my pocket on the way back to my seat. And that makes me laugh. (laughs) I don't know if I could do a fast food hot dog place because my brain's going, well, if we're going to do cheap, nasty style, like go grab some Franks. And, you know, we have a microwave. We have a pot of boiling water. We can make this work. Yep. You get it with the boiling. The boiling is very important with a hot dog. Wait, you're pro boiling more than grilling? Yeah. You just said you get a thing of oil and water, you can make it work. I mean, I could. I would. Would that be my (laughs) first go-to? I mean, no, but I'm also not going to knock a a boiled hot dog. Like to me, a boiled hot dog is like we're in like a Russian village and it's really (laughs) cold and we just found these hot dogs and like we're all going to gather around children and we're going to put it in the pot and like, you know, this is a utility thing here. But I'm with Brian on this. I'm going to grill that sucker. You grill it first. If there is an open flame nearby, for sure. Okay. That's correct. The move is you do the boil and then you hit the grill. What? Yes. Why not? Walk me through this. Who has that kind <laughs> of time, Layton? This is like you're going to sous vide and then sear a steak, except it's for a tube of processed meats. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? We're all going to okay. die, guys. 
buns. You buy a thing of hot dogs and you buy a thing of buns and it's uneven. That's already like too much emotional labor for me and I don't want to deal with it. So I'm saying this as somebody who has not purchased hot dogs or buns in probably a decade. But as a child, like Nono used to make, you know, you do your little boil and then you throw it on and then... <laughs> right on, right on. And then you throw a fucking craft single on it. Why not? Whoa. Oh, wow. Man. That's what I love about the hot dog is like, you can make a hot dog whatever the fuck you want it to be. Yes. Yeah. Have you guys been to Pink's here in LA? What is that? So Pink's is one of these old school, I don't even know exactly when it's from, maybe as early as the 30s, possibly from the 50s. And I think it was in some like Tarantino movie or something like that. Maybe like Reservoir Dogs, I can't remember. Or maybe that's just Mr. Pink I'm thinking of. It's a classic hot dog stand where they have like hot dogs named after celebrities and they have a million different fucking things on the dog. And a lot of them are local California celebrities or like old school Hollywood, like the Milton Berle. It's a 16 inch dog wrapped in pastrami with 12 slices of American cheese. Or you can just get a like a standard, you know, dog with sauerkraut or whatever. So it's a complete tourist destination. Half the time, the lines are untenable if you go before 11 p.m. But it is my go to. I'm coming home from a show late at night. This happens like once every six months now, if that. I'm driving home after 11 o'clock. I didn't eat dinner because I got to the show early. Fuck it. I'm going to Pink's. And you just drive in, you get a chili dog or two. And to me, it is like the classic LA experience. And it's such a good hot dog. Like there really is something magical about this hot dog. It lives up to the hype. I wouldn't wait online three hours for it, but. Sure, sure. I will show the fuck up for a chili dog. Oh, these are good chili dogs. Yes, I love a chili dog. Okay. How have you not been to Pink's, Layden? Because I like hot dogs, but I'm not going to go out of my, I especially don't want to stand anywhere in a line (laughs) to get a food item. It's not happening for me. I would say I've got things to do and places to be, but I don't. I just don't want to stand around other people. But maybe I'm not selling it hard enough because when you get to the end of the line, the cashier does yell at you. And they give you free tissues, too. Yeah. (laughs) All the tissues you can eat. All the tissues you can shove in that little mouth. They'll just give them to you. Layton, have you not had a single, I waited X amount of time for this meal and it was totally worth it? You haven't had one of those moments where it's just like, oh, this was worth two hours. Oh, I'm not waiting two hours for anything, man. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe a roller coaster. Mm, Okay. All right. In terms of your age, you're at the peak of, I'm going to wait two hours for brunch. Now that goes away once you pass your mid twenties. Oh, it's already gone away. When I was 24, I would wait, you know, online for brunch for two hours with friends just hanging out. Like that was a pretty standard Mm. thing. Why? Because you're just hanging out with people. It didn't matter. I guess. But if I'm going to go to a brunch place, I'm going to go real early before the hipsters wake up. That's the move. That's my move now as it was probably once I passed 30 or so. But yeah, in my 20s, it was all about like, oh, you go to the popular brunch place because you know how cool I am, right? And you know how I'm always doing cool stuff and going to cool (laughs) places that people think are cool. Well, (laughs) sometimes you have to wait online when you go to cool places just to be cool, to be seen. I didn't even eat. I was just there for the scene because you know how much I love scenes. Brian goes to a place, the line forms once they see that he's there. That's exactly right. He's the star of the queue. He's a trendsetter. And then I wait in that line. (laughs) Just to be a man of the people. Because, <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be above anybody. No, 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 no. Come on. I have to keep it real. That's what we do in New Jersey. We keep things real. <laughs> of course. One of my favorite things to do when traveling is to find the food. I will ask locals. I'm like, where do I go for this? Like, I do research ahead of time. Hell yeah. Like, years ago, we went on a group trip to Japan and everyone was like, okay, we'll each pick an activity in every city that we're going to. And we can talk about which one we want to do. All of mine were food. Every single one was like, Tokyo has this great pizza place named Savoy. Please. (laughs) I'm with you, dude. That's how I travel. You land and you look for the food. Mm -hmm. Always. It's food and then also me Googling weird things to do in X city. Like, that's the move. What was the weirdest thing you found in a city that you were visiting? The first thing that comes to mind is there's a haunted bookstore in Melbourne, Australia. Please say more words. Wow. Yes. Um, I went to Melbourne to give like a keynote speaking thing. It, oh my God, I can't believe I don't remember the name of this convention, but they invited me to do the keynote. It was a 45 minute speech for what I thought was going to be a hundred people. And then I got there and they were like, all right, we're going to do it. 
And I was like, hey, how many people are going to be here? This is a really big auditorium. And they're like, oh, like a thousand people. <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> wow. But the opener was a really cool guy playing the didgeridoo. So that oh, made right. me feel better. But anyway, I found this haunted bookstore and a bunch of people wanted to come with me. And then I think they did not anticipate that I wanted to be there for like two hours uh, because mm-hmm. it was just run by an old guy. And I feel like I harassed that old guy to just talk to me about everything because they had like you know, occult books, all that kind of stuff, but then like weird jewelry. And he was talking about like the history of female serial killers in Australia. And I barely remember anything about it, but he was telling me that like Guillermo del Toro, that's like his favorite spot there. And every time he comes to Australia, he comes in. The bookstore is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right. That's cool. But yeah, it was really incredible. And I came home and I had to do some real like reallocating for the huge stack of books that I had purchased there. I actually... Talk amongst yourselves. I'm going to go grab the books that I bought from that store real quick. God, yeah. Yeah. I want to hear all about this. Okay, you said you had a weird one. It's almost a cliche weird one at this point, but when I was in Tokyo, I always look at weird museums. So I went to the Parasite Museum in what? Meguro. Yeah. It's, it makes a list of like top weirdest museums in the world. It's pretty small. It's way the fuck out. I don't remember Tokyo geography very well, but I had to like travel to get to it. You could take the train, but it wasn't close. This was about 10 plus years ago now. And I don't think it had quite made the name for itself that it has now. So half the signs weren't in English. It was just Japanese. Google Meguro, which is M-E-G-U-R-O, Parasite Museum, Tapeworm. Oh! <gasps> Yep, there it is. That came out of a body. It looks like a sea creature that would be attached to like a coral reef or something. Right? Oh my lord. So this museum was awesome. That is tight as hell. That's my first obvious answer is the Meguro Parasite Museum in Tokyo. That upsets me deeply and I'm so happy for you, Brian. (laughs) It was a special moment. I was there essentially by myself, although I was kind of visiting a physics friend. And I was like, dude, do you want to go to the Parasite Museum? And he was like, absolutely not. <laughs> so I, was, I, just I was imagining you being like, Rachel, Rachel, take my picture with the tape. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here, put it in my mouth. <laughs> but yes, Layton, did you return with books? I found only half of my stack as I was scanning. So I got Field Guide to Demons, Vampires, and Fallen Angels. Tight. Fun. I discovered that I had actually bought two copies of that book. I bought one at the store and then I got home and was like, wait a second, I own this. Why did I buy a second one? (laughs) Well, now you have a haunted one, so that one's better. Yeah. This incredible cover, Extraterrestrials Among Us, just like A plus Mm. design. The gods unknown in the challenging tradition of chariots of the gods, exciting new revelations and startling photographs. This one's also about aliens. Again, incredible typeface. I mean, like, look at that. Are these Australian books or are they just being sold? Okay. They're just books. I got another incredible cover, The Strange World of the Occult. Oh, wow. I haven't like thoroughly read any of these. And then I got two different books about cannibalism. (laughs) 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 Contingency cannibalism and then cannibalism and human sacrifice. So these are always fun to whip out. Wow. Contingency cannibalism? Oh, man. Yeah, this one was disappointing because I thought it was going to be pretty legit. And it's sort of like a comedy sort of thing. I don't know. It's weird. Anyway, those are my books. I don't want to do another tangent. That's what this show is for. Do it. I had a conversation recently. I need to phrase this question carefully. If you knew that it was sourced uh, holistically and, and morally green light, there was no nefarious deeds that happened in the acquisition of it. Uh-huh. And a like five-star chef was offering to cook it for you. Would you eat human flesh? Yes. So we, we, we are thank guaranteed. You, thank, you, thank you. We're guaranteed that no, no one, no one did this unwillingly. It's all above board. You know what? Just to make it more interesting, we're going to say that this five star chef was like, "I wanted to create the ultimate dish. This is just a little bit of my delicious meat. I chose to do this. Who wants to snack on me, Chef Chuck?" Oh, okay. I'm in. Yeah, sure. I'm going to eat that. Well, because there's like that famous Reddit post of the guy who made foot tacos because he had to get his foot amputated. And then he made tacos and invited all of his friends over and they all ate his foot tacos. And everyone reacts to that like it's one of the most horrifying things on Reddit. And to me, I'm like, what a beautiful thing. Like you have to get it amputated and all your friends get to try your flesh. Like how funny would that be? You all now get to share. We have practiced cannibalism together and you have eaten my foot. (laughs) 
Like, I would do it 100%. That is based entirely upon the heads up. If I'm given a heads up, I'm like, cool. If I'm not given a heads up, I'll be like, what the fuck, Chad? By the way, you tasted great. Yeah. Oh, well, I think the, the way to do it is, of course, just invite people over for dinner, put on the fake leg or whatever, and then halfway through the meal, be like, guys, guess what? Oh, no. That's how you lose so many friends for the rest of your life. Yeah. That's how you get Wendigos, dude. <laughs> We didn't consider the Wendigo factor in that hypothetical, did we? Well, yeah. You know. Yeah, you can't bring those into your house. That's an important, the W factor, yeah. I brought up that question while visiting family in North Carolina recently over dinner, and I might as well have just said, I'll be leaving now. Have a great rest of the <laughs> evening. <laughs> no one was on my side. They were all immediate no's? My mother was like, Miles. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> If you were asking that question as preparation for you to whip out a cooler of human flesh and be like, well... Yeah, it's not like I sadly stuffed a vacuum-packed hand back into my pocket like, oh man, that was really <laughs> expensive. Is it in the Bible that you shouldn't eat people? Is that in there somewhere? I can't remember. Um, not that I've read the Bible too much. You know what? Let's ask Dr. Google. Is it cool with God? Here, type this. Is it cool with God <laughs> if y'all eat folks? What does the Bible say about cannibalism from gotquestions.org? Let's see here. Da, da, da. There's no direct statement. Hell yeah. I like how they provide an example. Although there is no direct statement such as thou shalt not eat human flesh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, the obvious indication from scripture is that cannibalism is terrible and evil. Well, you know what? Everybody translates that book differently. So, so shellfish, bad. Yeah. Human flesh, good. <laughs> as soon as you're talking about the Bible and you say the obvious implication, I'm out. Like, no one's going to agree on that. Mm -hmm. Aside from Dr. Google and the Bible, there's the AJJ album, People Who Can Eat People Are the Luckiest People in the World, which I agree. <laughs> Beautiful title. <laughs> Have you guys listened to any AJJ, formerly known as Andrew Jackson Jihad, who shortened their name? I've I don't know never if even I heard of them. Really, it's very optimistic folk punk. I recommend that album very highly. It's like, if you want to be mad and happy and listen to some punk saying it like it's really great adding that to spotify right now i've been in like idols mode for like the last year <laughs> and then now need to mix that up a little bit didn't they just drop a new album i don't know if they did i actually just saw them like two weeks ago in austin and it was amazing vernon was telling me that they just dropped a new album let me look albums crawler came out oh 2021 yeah oh shit have i listened to this oh, wow. one? Oh, i have listened to this one i just didn't realize <laughs> i don't know idols at all Idols is a wonderful British punk band that sing about beating up homophobes and fascists, and they're great. They're fantastic. They're super nice, too. Awesome. Oh, really? Yeah. They came into Austin, and so they normally open with a song called, I think it's Colossus. Yeah. And Colossus has like a four-minute slow build that's great, and then a pause, and then the last 90 seconds are just absolute power rage. <laughs> and it got to that dip, and you know the bass is just like, boom. And he just leans at the microphone and goes, everyone be fucking nice. Da, da, da. And then like just the moshing started. Some guy was having a birthday, his 26th birthday, and he brought him up on stage and put him on his shoulders and made everyone oh, sing wow. happy birthday to him and then kept him there for their next song. Like they were insane, man. They were insane. That's awesome. God, that rules. Circling back around, you have family in North Carolina because I am from North Carolina. Yeah, my brother and his wife a few years back moved into Asheville and now in Waynesville, about 40 minutes outside of Asheville, which everyone is like, Asheville's the Austin of North Carolina. And I think that seems fair. It was like a lot of cool hip breweries and stuff. And it was awesome. We went up there for a week. It was the first time like my whole family and my partner had all like been together since, you know, the pandemic kicked off. So it was really, really cool. That's lovely. I feel like every... Red state gets one town that other people officially designate as cool. It's yeah. like Athens and Georgia or Tulsa <laughs> and Oklahoma or Austin and Texas. And that's not to say there aren't plenty of other great, cool and pretty liberal cities. But I feel like there's always one place, usually a university town, that gets designated the cool place in, in North Carolina. Which Asheville is, yeah. That's Asheville, yeah. It's beautiful there. Holy cow. Mountains, baby. Oh, is it in the mountains? Yeah, it's like Blue Ridge Mountains. Is that it? Smoky? Smoky sounds right. Smoky, I know, is 
Tennessee and maybe they go, I can never quite remember. Jesus Christ, I'm from North Carolina and I don't even remember exactly what the mountains are, just that there are mountains and there's a, an area where the mountains in like Georgia and North Carolina kind of come together. And so my like memories of those areas are blurry because I'm like, is that in Georgia or North Carolina? I don't remember, but it doesn't matter because they all look the same. <sighs> Dude, mountains like still trip me out. Like when I went to Los Angeles a couple years ago, like anytime there was a mountain, like we're in a car and I'd always just be looking out the window with the mountain like, oh, golly, gee, that's big. Same. <laughs> Don't get used to it. Same. And they're all over here and they're like right there. You can like drive there. They're real fucking close. And there are all these big, cool, like, you know, kind of beige, rocky mountains. Mm. And it's my favorite part of the geography here. And then you can drive into them. And you can go up to like Big Bear or whatever, and then you're in the fucking mountains and it's snowing or whatever. It's it's incredible. Yeah, the mountains here are underrated. The first time I went to L.A., like we were only there for a day and I made a point like I had four hours to kill. And I was like, I'm going to get in a taxi and go to the beach. And I was with Bernie Burns at the time. And he was just like, you're only going to be able to be there for like 40 minutes. I was like, yeah, but I've never touched the Pacific Ocean. So I, I want to. And oh, he was like, wow. All right. Well, then you know what? Screw the taxi. Let's just go. So we went down there. <laughs> and I remember standing in the sand with waves lapping at my ankles and I could see mountains. Like Todd Howard's voice was in my head, like, you can go <laughs> to those mountains over there. And I'm just like, okay, I get it. Like, I get it. It's delightfully beautiful here. Okay. I get it. <laughs> you don't have to keep rubbing it in nature. <laughs> you know, I grew up in Jersey where the coast is pretty close to, you know, I didn't grow up in a beach town or anything. I mean, obviously you can get to like New York and whatever from where I grew up, which is pretty close, but you can get to the quote, the shore within an hour, an hour and a half drive. Mm -hmm. I always forget that most of the country does not grow up within spitting distance of water and actually touching a, you know, capital O ocean is, <laughs> is unusual. For most folks. Yeah. So growing up in Texas absolutely ruined my sense of geography. I'm just like, what do you mean it doesn't take 12 <laughs> hours to get out of your state? I don't understand. And so like I was interviewing for a job in the UK at some point last year. And it was funny because I was talking with them and they're like, yeah, we're in Leamington Spa. And I'm like, oh, that's dope. My partner, she has family in London. That's really great. And they're like, oh, I mean, that's like an hour away. And I just yep. remember being like, Oh, that's cute. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> it's so European. If you're European and someone's like, yeah, that's two hours away. It's like, well, I'm not fucking going there ever. Can you imagine? <laughs> Can you imagine going that far? I remember talking to a friend in Amsterdam once about going to somewhere else in Holland, which like, I think to get from one end of the Netherlands to the other, it's like a two hour drive or something. It's like, it's a small country, you know? And they were like, we don't fucking go over there. Like that's, that's <laughs> really far. It's like an hour train ride. It's like, whoa. <laughs> it's a different conception of distance. What's a coastal city in Texas? Like Galveston? Oh, yeah. My whole family is in Galveston. Galveston, Port Aransas, South Padre, Corpus Christi. That's the, hey, it's summer. We're going to go over there. And I grew up going to Galveston off a of family. And shout out to Port Bolivar. Woo. Galveston's very close to Texas City. So there's lots of like chemical refineries. It looks like the background of Chemical Plant Zone from Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Like that's Texas City. <laughs> uh-huh. And I remember thinking it was very cool. Now that I'm older, I'm like, this breaks my heart. But that area, you get a lot of runoff from the Mississippi River. So the water mm -hmm. is just like brown, brown, brown water. Oh, There's wow. There's seaweed everywhere. There's lots of jellyfish. And like, as a kid, I was like, the beach. And now, you know, everybody's like, oh, you go to South Padre, the water's like kind of greenish. And you're like, oh, wow, fancy. Wow, kind of greenish. <laughs> It's like a greenish blue from what I remember. Is it like beach culture? It's like a beach anywhere or so when I think of beach culture, I think like so there's like the boardwalk type of thing you get sometimes where it's like that Venice or Wildwood in Jersey or something like that. There's like kind of the chiller other parts of L.A. version where it's just like sand and water and it's not real rocky. That's what I think of as classic beach culture. It's kind of like that. Definitely like in those big port cities, almost every one of them has like a pier with a Ferris wheel on it. But like uh -huh. everyone knows it's like, this is trying to be something that it isn't quite, <laughs> but it's still very charming. And they have a Bubba Gump shrimp uh, here. So we're going to go hang out here. Of course. Yes, you have to. <laughs> Most of the beaches though, like in Texas, it's like a lot of grassy sand dunes. If you're lucky enough to live right off the beach, there'll be like a little neighborhood and then like a big long 
I guess pier, but like usually the big dunes and stuff are filled with like weeds and cactus and stuff. So you'll walk across like a bridge to get over all that until you get to the sand. And then it's just like a lot of tents, a lot of people who bring grills, a lot of golf carts, so many golf carts. Oh, wow. Interesting. Oh yeah. People drive golf carts all over the beaches in Texas. I recently had to do research for this Christmas special thing that I wrote about Texas. And so I was looking up like Texas holiday traditions and Corpus Christi straight up has a golf cart holiday parade in December. Wow. And then usually there's like a bunch of people with stinky flags driving around in big trucks compensating for things. And you're just like, (laughs) I don't like you, but I'm going to just chill here. Let's not interact, please. (laughs) Did you guys ever as like a kid, maybe I don't know, like 14, 15, get to drive a golf cart and think you were in charge of the universe? Yes. Yes. I considerably younger did that with certain family members who were around my age and was run over by a golf cart repeatedly by them. You got run over by a golf cart? (laughs) Yeah. What? You guys haven't been run over by a golf cart? We talking leg? We talking arm? We talking like full on abdomen? We're talking foot and then countless other times literally being hurled off of the golf cart. Oh my God. Did you get hurt bad? I mean, the foot one was pretty fucking bad. I had to use a little crutch while I was there. Um, Oh, no. I don't recommend it. And I also cannot describe the terror of a hellion child around your age just coming at you with a golf cart. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) Wow. That's not my golf cart experience. So we weren't allowed to drive the golf cart anymore. I think Gotcha. family members got rid of it due to these repeated incidences. (laughs) And that's understandable i would say yeah Yeah. my grandmother uh in galveston she lives like right on i wouldn't call it the beach but i would call it the water like there's land and then there's a bunch of like concrete debris and then there's water and so all those houses are on stilts because of all the hurricanes that come through and stuff which when children are in a golf cart that home becomes like a lookout tower where my grandmother is like, she's making tamales or whatever, but she's right near that window and she knows like the one stretch that we can drive down. Uh Ooh, we would hear it if we got back and we were going too fast. But then being, (laughs) you know, cantankerous little children, we spent time to find blind spots. Then then we go like small for me, like slow for me ma, and then gas it like we were Vin Diesel. (laughs) (laughs) Were you part of the Christmas tamales tradition, Miles? Was that a thing in your family? So it is on my father's side of the family. However, most of the time that would happen like a day or two before we would arrive at the coast because we would have our own like Christmas Eve, Christmas morning. And then a lot of times on Christmas Day, when most people are at home, that's when my father is like, there won't be traffic. So then we would hop in a car and ride for four and a half to five hours to Port Bolivar. And yeah, by that point, those tamales are already done and they're pretty damn good. That's the best. Shout out to the Luna family making good tamales. Thanks, Mima. <laughs> oh, she, she doesn't have internet. She won't listen to this. I'll just have to tell her what I see. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I would like to loop back around to a quick fast food ranking that Brian will be excluded from. Okay. So, okay, Berg's, best Berg. I need to preface all of this with a question. Are we talking in the moment eating Or are we also including the grace period after consumption? Go on about the grace period. Oh, wow. This is a good question. So I would regularly in my younger years go to McDonald's and order two double cheeseburgers, a hot and spicy McChicken, and an order of fries and just put it away like it was nothing. And I loved it. Oh, my God. And then during the grace period was when my body was like, What the fuck are you doing? (laughs) (laughs) We're shutting this shit down. We're taking the golf cart away. Uh Uh-huh. There's a burger stand place here in Austin, and I think it's spreading to like San Marcos now, but it's called P. Terry's that is become my new favorite fast food place because like they have like organic, whatever, holistic ingredients, but like genuinely it is a good burger and I do not feel physically bad after eating that hamburger. Because I will go all in on gluttonous, like shark smelling blood in the water just during the consumption. But it's going to mm-hmm. be a different answer for including the grace period. Let's forget the grace period. I think the McDonald's. grace period is so, <laughs> it's so subjective to everyone's bodies and shitting schedule, you know? So we're in the moment. McDonald's for you, that's the best burger? The burger, I'm going to go McDonald's. I love me. Just a double cheeseburger. I'll hold the onion. I don't like how small they dice their onions. 
don't do that. Just give me a ring, please. Really? You like the ring? <laughs> I like an onion that I know is there. And I think this comes from the fact that when I was a child, I did not like onions or pickles, but being McDonald's, it would fuck that up a lot. And so I'd be biting and then you just get these tiny little like crunches and I'd be like, and I peel back the bun and there's the mustard ketchup mess and this sprinkling of microscopic onions. Mm. You cannot get that off. It is embedded in the cheese. You're scraping off everything if you want to get those onions out. That's true. They get behind enemy lines and they're there. They are the parasites of that burger. <laughs> I just want to know if the onion's going to show up. I don't want it hidden. I completely and totally respect that. Okay. All right. I'm weirder about a ring because it's a little obtrusive. You're correct. It's easier to take out, but it's just so much onion and then also you have to deal with like, can I bite all, like depending on if it's cooked in there, like mm -hmm. if it's cooked, which I love a cooked onion, but if it's a ring, you get the tapeworm experience of like, it's just yes. going to suck out of this burger. That's exactly the problem with an onion ring is that you take yes. one bite. <laughs> this was where I was going. And then you are kind of in it. Like you kind of have to eat the whole thing or it falls out weird or it balances oddly. Yes. You suck it out like it's a disgusting <laughs> onion straw. And then you munch on your little fried ring. Yeah. You put your mouth on it like your friend's just been bitten by a venomous snake and you <laughs> just get that thing out of there. <laughs> and then places that have bottomless onion rings. I only need one. I need a single onion ring. Like, I don't want rings. I don't want a tower, Red Robin. We could easily make this entire podcast a battle of the fast foods. I'm going to say what might be a controversial statement here, mm -hmm. but I'm going to say it in an attempt to just get to the heart of the matter. Whenever people say, what is the best fast food? And I'm talking like fast food, not like, oh, fast food in California. Fast food. No, just general global fast food. To me, the question they're asking is, what do you like more, McDonald's or Wendy's? Oh, shit. Because here is going to be my burger answer. Please. Which is, it's not going to be in and out which I feel like would be the typical thing for a person in California to say. And I don't even know if this is considered fast food, but I'm going to go Fuddruckers on this. No, no, Ooh, no. Not allowed. That falls into Chili's nope. territory for me, my okay. man. I'm, I don't know. But it's a good burger. <laughs> is there a waiter at Fuddruckers? There is not. No, you have to go to the counter to order. Mm. Is there a drive through at Fuddruckers? There is not. As far as I recall. Okay, there, no, out. I think the metric has to be drive through Yeah, that's the fastest oh. food available. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So saying that, does Five Guys count? I wish. I don't think it does. Does it not? I don't think it does. Too many guys. Is <laughs> if it was three guys. If it was three guys and like a nice lady and a child. <laughs> that's just an interesting family unit. Yeah. But I don't know. I don't know if it does. They don't have drive throughs Okay. Yeah, because I love right. Five Guys. Me too. That's the best burger for me. If I want a burger and I want to feel like shit, and same with fries. So they don't count, but I'm just putting it out there that a Cajun fries. Five Guys burger is like the great, oh, the Cajun fries. <sighs> you ask for an order of fries and they give you a full burlap sack of potatoes <laughs> is what happens <laughs> Yeah, it, it's like in fantasy things where it's like, oh, I'm going to pay for my beer with a sack of coin that I'm going to drop <laughs> on the table. And it's that, but with Cajun fries. And like you have Dr. Nick's <laughs> window to weight gain <laughs> just right in the side. <laughs> Wendy's is clearly a better hamburger than McDonald's, right? Hold on. Mm. <sighs> See, this is where my grace period comes in. I think Wendy's is a better burger than McDonald's. However, McDonald's is just like, we have 30% salt, 30% sugar, 30% fat, and 10% uh, corporate mind control. Like, it's exactly what you want. <laughs> yeah. Also, Wendy's fries are shit. They are so bad. That's true. Wendy's fries are bad. The fact that I can't even remember what they taste like, I think proves your point. For me with Wendy's, like maybe I will get a burger, but for me, it, it's all about their shitty baked potatoes. Like I love those <laughs> things so much with all of the fake butter. What an odd choice. I'm just saying for a fast food restaurant, it's a hard swing. Like, I don't know, baked potatoes, fuck it. Why not? Oh, dude, what you just said is the jack-in-the-box method, okay? Jack-in-the-box oh, is like, God. what frozen food can we throw into a fire and serve up? Oh, my God. It's so weird. It's so bad. I've never eaten at a jack-in-the-box. They scare me. I'm sure people love them, but it's just too much. If we're going, like, allowed to say regional, but not to California, it's cookout. 
in North Carolina. I don't. What is that? What is cookout? Never heard of it. You've never been to cookout? I uh-uh. swear to God, we've talked about cookout on the show before. In terms of grace period, it is the bowel equivalent of just stepping into a blast furnace. <laughs> <laughs> it's horrific. Oh, it's no. so awful. They're like big claim to fame is that they have 50 flavors of milkshake and they always have it on the sign and you can mm. get like any combination. They do not care. They will put a slice of cheesecake in that shake if you want them to because they have cheesecake for some reason. It probably is not this cheap anymore, but in high school, they have like a Five dollar box where you can get a fat, disgusting burger, fry, and like you get the choice of sides, but all the sides should be meals in themselves. Or you can get like a hot dog, or a bunch of McNuggets, or a corn dog, or like it is the wild, wild west. It is a complete nightmare. And there was one too close to my house in high school, and right next to my school, and it is the greatest. Never even heard of this. I want to see Cookout and Jack in the Box fight. I want to see the personified versions (laughs) of those two chains just duke it out, Godzilla versus Kong style. Are you guys young enough to remember the big Jack in the Box E. coli thing? Yes. No? Oh, my God. That was, I think, in the early 90s, maybe? Late 80s, possibly? No, wait. I think I'm thinking of the Subway E. coli thing. Yeah, there's a number of E. coli things that happened to various institutions, but there was a big Jack in the Box one. I feel like it might have been the late 80s. Well, and also, so we didn't have them in Jersey. So it was just like, what is this fucking thing I've never heard of that is poisoning people? It was a very confusing time. So I grew up in San Antonio, Texas, and Tex Mex, it makes you very defensive of what is and is not like. Tex Mex, what is a taco, and all that stuff. Uh-huh. And like, I remember like being younger, being like, why would anyone ever want to eat at Taco Bell? It's gross. Uh, Las Palapas has great tacos. Oh, Layton, are you mad? No, I agree with him. And then now I got older, I'm like, oh, because sometimes you don't want a taco, sometimes you want Taco Bell, which is in its own category. Exactly. And this is how I feel about the Jack in the Box two tacos for 99 cents. Oh, it's a different thing. It's just like a of soy meat. <laughs> And then a hard taco shell with a slice of American cheese, flash fried, and then they drizzle a little bit of shredded lettuce on there. And then the piece de resistance is their taco sauce just whips. It's just like a spicy, vinegary, it's kind of smoky. You're selling it. I'll agree with this. Taco Bell taco sauce rules. And again, and it's a different thing. I don't want salsa but I will take that fire sauce on this meat tube that you've provided me Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with Dorito powder on it. I so desperately miss the Verde Taco Bell sauce. It was so good. I never even knew it. I came too late in life. I don't want to talk about Taco Bell too much. (laughs) I've never heard you say that. They're so good at tempting you with a perfect object and then taking it away of like, oh, that was limited edition. Sorry. They had a fucking chick star, quote unquote, series of crunch wraps where it was just like a fried chicken patty like you would get on like a chicken sandwich in the crunch wrap. They also did a Mm -hmm. series of mini crunch wraps that came in a bunch of different flavors. But instead of like the half of a taco shell or whatever they put in a crunch wrap, it was like Fritos. So it was just like a Frito stuffed baby crunch wrap, and you could put away three of those easy. Just like a flight wow. of crunch wraps. <laughs> yes, yeah, truly. They had a different, like, fun little sauce for each one. Like, they're so good at just dangling that disgusting artificial carrot in front of your face and being like, fetch, bitch. <laughs> I'm never going to eat this again. <laughs> Have you guys ever been to a Del Taco? I've never been to a Del Taco, partly because the name makes me mad, where I'm like, <laughs> what of the taco? Right. <laughs> What What is it of the taco? That's not a complete thought. I had it once and it was just brown gravy on stuff. It was not my bag. Yeah. I very much though still want to eat at a taco bueno off of being featured in King of the Hill. I've never eaten at a taco bueno. Oh, is that a real thing? It's a real thing, bud. Come on down to Texas. There's no fucking rules here. <laughs> wow. It's a real thing. Okay. That's fascinating. Because it's such a stupid name. I just assume they made that up. Where's the nearest taco bueno to me? <gasps> There's one in Austin. Oh, Miles. Okay, don't you call this a Mexican restaurant, Google. Come on now. <laughs> oh, the logo is... Powerful. Yeah, the energy of the logo. I actually kind of love it. Because you have to admit that sounds like something Mike Judge would make up. It really does. And that's what I assumed it was for years until a friend of mine from Dallas was like, oh, dude, Taco Bueno rules. I was like, what? <gasps> wow. It's 22 minutes south of me. 
not worth it at all. I got to go through downtown Austin. <laughs> I, you might as well tell me to go to Antarctica. It's not happening. But the next time I'm down south, oh, I'm going to be tempted. This logo, which is just the word bueno in a speech bubble, is fucking awesome. <gasps> That's what I'm talking about. I'm looking at pictures of the food right now. This looks like a hybrid between the snackability of a Taco Bell treat with some of the like attempt at authenticity that you'll get from a Taco Cabana. Now, another place I've never been to or heard of. Oh, Taco Cabana. Their whole thing is like they're like a super bright pink. At least they used to be. I don't know if they are anymore. And they would do like fast food. Like they have a drive through and you can order enchiladas and tacos and all that stuff. Oh, yes. I've passed one of these before in Texas. Yes, yes, yes. As a child, there was one near my grandmother's house in San Antonio. The building was shaped like a giant sombrero. You could have handed me dirt in that restaurant and I would have been like, yeah, you got to go to Taco Cabana. Mm, it's got a sombrero shaped building. <laughs> If a building is shaped like something, there's a name for that that I can't remember in architecture, you have to go. In North Hollywood, there's the Idle Hour, which is shaped like a giant barrel. And it's <gasps> like, you got to go to the barrel. Are you kidding? You can have a drink in the barrel. <laughs> One of my like favorite like subconscious games that I play is, did that used to be a Pizza Hut? <laughs> like, you know how all Pizza Huts have yes. that same hut roof? Like, you'll pass, yep. like, a building, and it's, like, now it's, like, a credit loan place, and it's got a blue top, but you're just sitting there like, hell no, credit loan. I think he <laughs> maybe used to be a Pizza Hut in a past life. Yeah, I do love awesome. the idea of sort of like a speakeasy where they're hiding the illegal Pizza Hut inside the building and the shape of the building is the signal like, oh, you want an extension on your credit line, wink, <laughs> and then they pull back the wall. And they let you in the back and you have terrible pizza. Yeah, it's like, did you read enough books? Would you like your personal pan pizza? <laughs> Would you like your mortgage stuffed? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so bummed that, you know, the Brown Derby, which used to be out here, was a classic Hollywood restaurant. It has been closed for years. It was shaped like a hat. Do you think it had something to do with the fact that it was named the Brown Derby, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> do you think that played into its failure at all? You don't want to go eat in a hat-shaped restaurant, Miles? I do. I mean, we've established that I do, and I will. But, like, okay, tell me if I'm even close, okay? It's a hat-shaped restaurant. Yes. Is it a cowboy hat-shaped restaurant? No, it's like a bowler hat. Oh, fuck. You, Brian, you could have said like any hat. That's the one that is throwing me for the biggest loop right now because I'm trying to guess oh. what they serve at the Brown Derby. And at first I'm like, it's got to be like some Cracker Barrel country gravy thing. But this bowler hat. It's weird. Breaks the paradigm. If you get food and they bring it to yeah. you, is it served in a hat? <laughs> of course it's served in a hat. And the hat gets real wet. <laughs> And you got to eat the whole thing. Just a hat of soup. <laughs> just a hat full of soup. And the hat has holes in it, by the way. It's just dripping soup out of the sides. And it's an upcharge. It's an important hat upcharge because you have to pay for the dry cleaning of the hat so that they may be reused. Yeah. I splurge. I pay for the option to keep the hat. But that's just me. <laughs> you can wear it out. If you wear it out, <laughs> the meal is free. If you bring it back, you get 15% off on any soup refill. Is it a soup place? It was one of these classic Hollywood restaurants that all the famous people went to. I believe it's where the Cobb salad was invented, unless I'm mistaken. I don't fucking believe I don't you, believe Ryan. that. I don't fucking believe First you. First of all, would I ever lie to you ever about anything? And, <gasps> I, and I'm insulted that you think I would. But I also might just be wrong. Okay, the first thing that comes up when I search Brown Derby, it is called the Hollywood Brown Derby, but it's a thing at Walt Disney World. <laughs> oh my God, Wikipedia has the answers though. It always does. Oh my God, everyone listening to this, as soon as you're able, please go to Wikipedia page for the Brown Derby. It is so much better than I could have imagined. You didn't tell me right? that they have gardens within the rim of the bowler hat? What? Okay, hold on. I'm looking at a different picture because you see the one side of the hat sign on top of the hat that says the Brown Derby, but on the inverse side of the hat, it says, eat in the hat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read you under the origin section of Cobb salad and Wikipedia. Various stories record how the salad was invented. One says that it came about in 1938 <laughs> at the Hollywood Brown Derby restaurant wow. where it became a signature dish. It is named after the restaurant's owner. Like, what if we made a salad that just was worse? Oh, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. <laughs> Robert Howard Cobb. <laughs> Stories vary whether the salad was invented by Cobb or his chef. 
Paul J. Posty, or Posty. The legend is that Cobb had not eaten until near midnight, and so he mixed together the spookiest left, I added the word spooky, leftovers he found in the kitchen, along with some bacon cooked by the line cook and tossed it with their French dressing. So. Somewhere in there is like a fantastic, like, comedy drama like biopic about like the invention of the Cobb salad and how it ruined the friendship between these two men. Oh yeah. Yes. That's right. I like that. It could be our generation's joy. It'll just be called tossed. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Tossed is great. Wow. All right. After this, we'll break into the writer's room. Who do you cast? <laughs> Who's Cobb? Also, it should be, you know, the opening to What's the original? Is it Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? Which one's the original one? The good one? Willy Wonka. Gene Wilder. Okay. Yeah. The opening to that movie is so iconic, so ASMR, beautiful chocolate assembly line. For this, yes. for Tossed, it's just the tossing of a salad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> In slow-mo, like throwing up the bacon bits and like egg. Cobb is the owner. Posty or Posty, let's say Posty is the cook. I'm going to cast these. I'm going to put Josh Brolin as... Cobb and Tom Holland as Posty. So there's a oh. generational difference. Oh, that's interesting. That's powerful. The two of them. Yeah. Or no, actually, I'm going to flip the script on this. Benicio del Toro mm. as Ooh. Cobb and as Posty. Let's see. Who's a good Posty here? I'm going to cast Ben Schwartz. Ooh, I haven't seen Ben in a minute. Interesting. Yeah. Did you Google what Robert Howard Cobb looks like. No. Well, you should. And I refuse. So I'm pitching either Daniel Day-Lewis or Ray Wise like 30 years ago. Oh. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. If we want to get like a little weird with it, like a much younger Billy Bob Thornton. Mm-hmm. Give me Hank Azaria. <gasps> yes. I want Hank Azaria's Cobb. And you know what? Just because I love to see him put Ryan Gosling in there. As the salad. As the salad. <laughs> That's about his acting range, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's just so nice to look at. It's like the H. John Benjamin character in Wet Hot American Summer. It's a talking salad. Oh, God. I love that the Cobb salad image on Wikipedia, Cobb salads usually don't look very nice, but that is really like the furthest extreme of most disgusting Cobb salad you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> Pictures of food are just the worst. Pictures of food, I think, are so fascinating when it comes to like marketing images because the length that people have to go to to make it look good. I worked with a guy that that was like his side gig for a while. And he's like, oh, the best trick in the book is when you want that cheese pool of the slice of pizza, you want that like mm -hmm. good, you get the one slice out, it's just dripping yep, off. Yep, yep, You screw the rest of the pizza into the cutting board so it will not move at all. What? I love that. Oh, wow. Yep, and then you cover the screws with pepperonis or whatever you can. But he was like, yeah, that was a go-to. That and just like spraying shit with water constantly. Yeah, I've heard the same thing with like hairspray. So Brian, we discussed doing a new segment, but that required preparation on your part. Ooh, Did you do yes. it? Guess. Guess if I did it. Did you do it? Guess if I did it. Yes? I did not do it. <laughs> what <Yeah>. the fuck, Brian? <laughs> what? I'm, I'm sorry. I was busy. Oh, you were busy. In my defense, I could have done it. <laughs> and I just chose not to. So, I was so excited to do this with Miles. I didn't have time. I'm Damn. sorry. Here, you know what? I'm going to try to do this on the fly. <gasps> Let's just see if this works. It's not going to work. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to see if this works. So, Brian, you also have to introduce the segment. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let me ask. Miles, give me a, a genre or a band or something like that where the YouTube video might have people saying, like, long negative comments oh, on it. Oh, oh, shit. Demonstrating their expertise. <sighs> So my heart says Nickelback, but I don't know if, if we've come so far away from it that now all the comments are going to be like Song of a Generation, you know? Yeah. Or, or Leighton, would Reddit be better for this? I think Reddit would be better. Yeah. Oh, Reddit loves to complain. So this segment is called Two Truths and a Bry, where we, <laughs> I, find comments on a whatever, Reddit post, YouTube video, something like that. Okay. And I read two actual ones and then make up a third. And okay. you have to tell me which is the one I made up. Which one is the bry? All right. Load 1,200 more replies. Oh, yes, my God. Please. See, this is when you sort by controversial, Brian. 
Oh, <laughs> Leighton, fuck. That's the way you do it. This is the Reddit hack. Hell yeah. <laughs> Oh, wow. Ooh, this is, this is... Was this perhaps the wrong thread to pick to sort by controversial <laughs> on? It's a really angry comment thread that's just like, Brown Derby isn't real. Stop trying to make <laughs> us believe that it's real. <laughs> no, they don't serve you soup in a hat. The fuck is this guy talking about? Then the next person being like, um, this, OP. I hate Reddit oh, so God. much. I'm so sick of, like those little like internet turns of phrases like this and i guess it's not really a phrase but like i'm all for hyping up your friends and their accomplishments but sometimes when it's like the all caps like oh my god crying it's the most amazing thing ever and it's like a picture of like a piece of toast or something i'm just like yeah this is gonna make all of that meaningless if we just keep shouting then words will stop meaning things yeah, there's like a lot of like, oh, I'm crying, but there's never like, oh, this is so great. I'm like shitting so hard right now. Like, that's not okay to say. <laughs> like, if we have rolling on the floor laughing and laughing my ass off, why is there not it's like, like laughing my shit out of my body? It's like I just ate a cookout. Oh my God. <laughs> I am ready with my. Entry. So, Miles, do you understand the concept of the bit here? It's two truths and a lie. The segment is called Two Truths and a Bry. I have picked two real comments on the Reddit thread, the Matrix, uh, what's it called? Resurrection. Resurrections, thank you. Poster. And I have written one of my own. And you have to tell me which one is the one I wrote. And two of these are real, and one of these is a just composed Brian Wecht original. Do you understand the terms as they have been presented to you? Not only do I understand, I've never been more ready in my entire life for anything. <laughs> okay. Two truths and the bride. Two truths and the bride. All right, here we go. I wonder if it's the disappointing pair of squeals or the flops like Jupiter Ascending that have diminished expectations here. Maybe both. I like Speed Racer and find both two and three to be at least watchable, but Jupiter Ascending is a complete and total failure. It got nothing right. Either way, I do want to see this. I am just not expecting to love it. That's number one. That feels reddity. And also, shout out, whether this is you or a random person on the internet, the only thing I will praise in that comment is Speed Racer does, in fact, slap, and I respect them for that opinion. Yeah, that is true. I'm not commenting, though. Number two. I don't know. After revolutions, I feel like they just don't have it in them anymore. I didn't understand the end of that anyway. Like, was Neo in the computer the whole time and now he's back? <laughs> just unclear and bad filmmaking. This one's you. <laughs> this one's you. <laughs> I think this one's Brian, but I want to hear the third one. Number three. This movie is going to be so bad. It will make revolutions look like a masterpiece. Hell, it will make Speed Racer look like the best film ever. Jupiter Ascending mm. will not hold a candle to it in terms of badness. Fuck. Oh, I was so positive the second one was you until you read that third one. Keep me with the second one one more time. The second one. I don't know. After revolutions, I feel like they just don't have it in them anymore. I didn't understand the end of that anyway. Like, was Neo in the computer the whole time and now he's back? Just unclear and bad filmmaking. Okay. That's the Bri. <laughs> You're going for Bri? I'm like pretty convinced. It's like the use of the word like badder in the third one. I'm going to go three. I'm going to go three. All right. Leighton is correct. Oh, number two was me. Number three, number three was Reddit. Damn, that's a good game. That's a good segment, bro, guy. Ooh. Thanks. I really prepared it. <laughs> I love that you were able to whip it together so fast. And I think I'm too familiar with the other fake comments <laughs> in yeah. the conversation that was the genesis of this bit. I'm too familiar with the patter <laughs> yes. of your fake ones. <laughs> I thought the giveaway was going to be in the one I wrote, was Neo in the computer the whole time? That was, that the was one. it for that me. That was what really made me think it was you. Oh, that was good. All right. And that is a segment we call Two Truths and a Bry. Speaking of which, we should move on to other segments. Well, we should move on to the other segment that we neglected to do, which was introducing this fucking podcast. Oh, of course. Yes, we should do that. Oh Everybody, <laughs> this is Late Night with Brian Wecht. My name is Brian Wecht. Over here, we have Leighton Gray. You already fucked this up, Brian. That's me. The other one was Brian Wecht. Mystery guest whose name we've said, God knows. Who are you? What are you doing here? Hi, 
I'm Miles Luna. I've been kidnapped and am forced to podcast against my will. Please help. <laughs> I'm just kidding. These people are wonderful and I'm happy to be He's here. He's just messing around, folks. <laughs> we, we are thrilled to have you back, dude. It's been almost a year and your last episode was one of my all-time favorites. And every time you show up anywhere, you're Same. just a ray of sunshine. So I love having you on. It's great to see you again. I'm just glad you remembered our podcast anniversary. Really means a lot. Of course. What did you get me? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we got you one bad gloop and two good gloops. Oh, yes, of course. That was the, the last episode was the one bad gloop episode. The gloop man splurgeth is maybe one of my favorite episode titles. Oh, man, it's strong. Wow. <laughs> one bad gloop. I feel like I need to read it again in honor of the gloop anniversary. Oh, we'll see if you can get through it this time. This is a fun full circle. I feel like I'm going to crush it. I don't remember every moment of one bad gloop, but my subconscious had like a guttural reaction to that <laughs> phrase. And I don't know what that means. <laughs> All right. I have the actual image for you, Brian, and I put it in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> But this is exactly what happened last time. How do I get this big enough to read it? Oh, wait, I got it. Hold on. It's being weird about... Oh, did the old man figure out how to use a computer? There you go. Shut... Oh, my God. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wow. Is the hard mode for this time a year later to test all of our comedic resilience is that not only can Brian not laugh, mm. none of us can laugh? Oh, I like that. Yes, that's very good. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I need to chew on a tissue to calm myself down. <laughs> I think you should. Smiling is okay, laughing is not. Is that fair? I think that's fair. <sighs> One bad gloop and she do it at Yonki. Two big splurge. <laughs> <laughs> Your soul is weak, Brian. <laughs> I was so close. <laughs> was it? Uh, we, we, we can't like do this again. In. We can't do this again. Uh, here we go. No, no, this time it's really it. I just needed to get that one out of my system. One bad gloop, and she do it at Yankee. Two big splurge, and a big... <laughs> <laughs> slower made it so much worse. Yeah, the slower is way worse. Oh, this is... Oh. All right, I'm okay. I'm really okay. One bad gloop, and she do it at Yankee. Two big splurge, and a big-ass gloopy. Three more yoinks, then buy me a smoothie. Poured up a gloop. That's a gloop. And a splurgy. Oh, yeah. Snaps, bud. That's it. You Snaps got it. it. I did. That's it. character growth. Last time, I think it took 20 minutes or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's beautiful. And, you know, people familiar with poetry, obviously, that's a piece about capitalism and how it ultimately corrodes all of mankind and yeah. our achievements. But, you know, it's also just a fun one. It's just a fun one to bring home for the holidays. So that's our gift from us to you. <laughs> Read it to your grandparents. <laughs> My name is Ozymandias, King of Gloops. <laughs> And I took the road less yonkied by. <laughs> <laughs> okay, glad we did that. I think it's safe to say I crushed it. Oh, yeah. Oh, I gotta stretch for it first. Oh, yeah, you need to stretch after a gloop. You don't want to hurt yourself. You'll be sore in the morning if you don't. Yeah, you're going to be splurging everywhere if you don't get that stretch out. I don't want to pull a smoothie. So uncomfortable. I almost dabbed right there. Did you see that? I like, almost <laughs> no. did a dab. That was cool. I told you I was cool. You sure did. You warned us how cool you were. And things get cool. All right. So, Miles, our first segment here is our pop culture recommendation segment. Mm. It is a chance for you to talk about something you've been enjoying recently. Maybe it's a book. Maybe it's a movie. Maybe it's a TV show. Maybe it's a video game. Whatever you've been consuming recently. It could even be something that you made. You make a lot of stuff. It could be something you made. It doesn't have to be. But the real joy here, you may remember from last time, is this segment has a theme song, which is particularly interesting. Now, the theme song did completely change since last time. Oh. It is a brand new, a brand new theme song, which I rewrote. I thought the first one was great, but I feel like this revised version I don't want to use words like remastering or re-recording or anything like that. I'm not doing the Taylor Swift thing where I went back and re-recorded my old works uh, as they were. I reinvented it from the ground up. Just like I went back, you know, we're almost 100 episodes into this podcast now. I just did this a few weeks ago. Uh, this is actually the debut of it today. I forgot to say that before. 
So even Leighton hasn't heard this yet. I wanted this to encapsulate where we started, what we've been through, and where we've arrived 100 episodes in. Now, since we started this, we've all been through COVID, and there's a whole lot going on in the world. We're different people than the people we used to be. I mean, I'm a different person now than the person I used to be when we started recording. That's neither here nor there. I wanted this to really encapsulate everything that I love about the show, everything I love about working with Layton, everything I love about having amazing guests like you on. So I went, I made a list of my musical influences. I ranked them. I did kind of like a NCAA basketball ranking where I paired them up and then kind of made a tournament chart of all the different influences. And I weighted them in a certain way that I think will be apparent when you hear the final audio file. Now, I do want to give you one caveat here, which is that the mix is a little rough. Okay. So I'm still ironing out the kinks. I haven't sent this out for mastering yet, in part because I was waiting to get y'all's feedback on it today. But I think you're really going to enjoy it. I think you're going to hear me in it. We've known each other for a long time now. You're going to hear all the different Brian's that you've known throughout the years. And you're going to hear a lot of Leighton in it too, if I did my job, right? Which I think I did. I don't want to build up expectations too high, but I'm pretty sure that you're going to listen to this and you're going to say, that's Brian, that's Leighton. That's a good combination of the two of them. And you might hear a little bit of yourself in there too. So, all right, here we go. I'm going to play it right now. Okay. Click. What's poppin'? What's poppin'? Unclick. And that is the What's Poppin' theme song. Thoughts. Take a moment. What do you say to something like that? You know? I mean, you're there. You're definitely there. It's unequivocally Brian. And yet, there is also Layton. And I like what you did with the tempo. Thank you. I caught that nod. I was picking up what you're putting down there. Yep. 69 beats per minute. Yep. All I can say is thank you for that, Brian. <laughs> well, you're welcome. To me, you know, tempo ain't nothing but a number. And <laughs> I tried to, to really, really get that across. Yeah. Wow. In the file. So thank you, Miles. I appreciate that. No, thank you. Thank you, Brian. I view what I do with this podcast as a public service. And as well, you should. I think that really came across in this song. So thank you for thanking me. <laughs> Wow. I mean, it's going to be hard to follow that talking about pop culture stuff because all I want to do is talk about that song, but we can try. I know. Mm. Well, Layden, what's popping? I feel like we need a palate cleanser. Get us out of this like wild headspace. Yeah, I know. It's a lot to take in. And it's funny because my What's Poppin' automatically had a palate cleanser built in because the thing that I'm going to say that I really enjoy is heinous and that nobody else should read it. Uh, so I was going to suggest another thing just in case... So there's this book. <laughs> <laughs> there's this book called Killer Show by John Berlick. Due to not anything that has happened in the news recently, I was like, hmm, I'm really curious about the history of the station nightclub fire and how that happened and how we make sure that doesn't happen again. And so I read this book, which is about it. And it is one of the most horrific things I've ever read. Is this the great white thing? Yes. Yeah, okay. Because I just saw that it was about station fire. And I was like, oh, cool. I'm going to read this and feel bad. Like two thirds of the way in the reveal, it feels like a, hi, I'm Troy McClure, but it's like the guy being like, hey, I was the attorney for this case. And now it's intense, dense legalese courtroom drama. Oh and it's about how he won like settlements for the, obviously a hundred people died in the fire. And so that's family after family after family, not even counting people who were injured, sometimes catastrophically. But he was able to win them $175 million. And the book, at that third act, essentially, is how he did it. And so it is, like, Whoa. incredible. And what a completely avoidable tragedy. Yeah. And reading the, like, greed and negligence and how none of the people who were directly responsible faced barely any consequences, but then through very smart and intensive seven years of lawyer lawyering, this team of lawyers was able to like sue the pants off of a ton of people and present things like, yeah, so if, if we go to trial on this and you're going to have to back yourself up, here's all that we have that suggests that you're culpable. And here's what the jury is going to hear. And then they play the tape of a bootlegger who was inside. And yeah. 
Then oh. they all were like, okay, here's $20 million. Wow. So, oh my God. Really fascinating. Partial moral of the story. If you have any form of soundproofing in your home, please make sure that it is not flammable because yeah. the kind that is flammable, oh my God, that shit goes up so fast. It's very scary. If you go to a venue, if you go anywhere, know where your exits are, know what direction they are. It's very, very important. I've been thinking a lot about this kind of thing recently with the tragedy on the Rust set, which is just awful, right? Yeah. But. Mm-hmm. I think what this is, is people are just cutting corners left and right all the time. And most of the time it works out just because it's fine. Yeah. And then some small fraction of the time it doesn't and people die. Yeah. And these are avoidable tragedies, but they're also, and I, I don't hear people saying this as much, part of a general like faster, cheaper, less safe ethos, which really has a human toll. Yeah. That is not an area that you skimp on. No. With NSP music videos, when we have a fake gun on set, we do a fucking safety check, fire it in the air, all that stuff. Like, whatever. I'm not an expert in the film industry, but it's just awful. But Mm. it's such a big problem, which is like, how can we drive costs down to the fucking ground Mm. that sometimes people die and it's got to change. And you can keep getting away with it if nothing bad happens to your face. That's right, which most of the time it doesn't. And by doing the good thing, you don't necessarily see the big positive thing, but like you're averting human pain and suffering. Also, the guy gives a lecture on YouTube where he talks about it. Very accessible speaker. Do not watch that video. That fucked me up way more than the book. Jesus. No, thank you. I don't mean the video from the fire, which is also something nobody should ever watch. No, no. But they had to do a bunch of fire tests of like recreating what the building was and what the materials that they were using for the soundproofing was. And that was like, okay, I'm not sleeping. Like it's literally just a controlled test. And it's like, oh, that's how fast it happened. Anyway, I didn't mean to go this deep into it. I'm just fascinated by it. Palette Cleanser, Mosquito, the album by the Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs. It's great. Also, Karen O performing (laughs) Sacrilege on Letterman which is great because Letterman never likes anything unless there's heavy drums and there sure are some heavy drums in that. And then he comes on and he was like, oh, that was great. So yeah, yeah, yes. And then to the other thing I recommended, no, no, no. Uh, Cool. Someone else. (laughs) Nice. All right, Miles, what you got? I recently rewatched it for the first time since college. And I think it might be one of my favorite live action films And I will preface this by saying it's from 2008, so there's some stuff in there that has not aged great, but Mm -hmm. it also kind of works in that the protagonist is absolutely supposed to be a giant piece of shit. I am talking about the film in Bruges. Oh, yeah. I haven't seen that in a long time. I love stories about terrible people just trying their best. Again, I haven't watched a lot of these since college, but I used to watch a lot of Guy Ritchie stuff because I just like gangsters and mobsters and criminals and assassins caught up in hilarious kerfuffles. (laughs) This cast rules. Colin Farrell, Brendan Gleeson, Ralph Fiennes, they're doing their damnedest in this movie. Colin Farrell (laughs) has some of the most, like, incredible facial performance and, like, just physical comedy in this movie. It's fantastic. But what I love about it is it's a film that does, like, my favorite thing, which is it opens with, like, comedy and then gets so absolutely dark and emotional oh, yeah. and like personal without getting too much into it. And then I guess also as a content warning, like this is a movie about like suicide and finding yep. the will to live for things. And I just think it's absolutely beautiful. It is a small contained, just like story about a handful of characters in Bruges for a couple of days and it rules and I love it. And you can watch it streaming. And yeah, I just rewatched it recently and I was like, fuck man. I love this movie. I actually rewatched it within the past couple of months as like a comfort rewatch. Mm-hmm. It's such a treat. I'm sorry I called you an inanimate fucking object. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was upset. <laughs> oh, dude, there's so many great setups and payoffs in this movie from like, yeah, lines like that to like the change in someone's pocket. Like, it is so, so great. Um, also, the arguing over whether or not they're going to have a gunfight in this hotel. <laughs> yes. Anybody who has seen the Harry Potter movies, everyone from Harry Potter's in it. It's great. Yeah, yeah, really, truly. Floor is in it. Floor, yeah. (laughs) And also, have you seen, I didn't appreciate this the first few times I watched this movie, because it is also one of my favorites, uh, Mm. that the remake of the movie that Floor is in is a remake of Don't Look Now, which I had not seen Don't Look Now until semi-recently. I'm not familiar at all. I haven't seen it, no. 
Don't Look Now is like a very famous Giallo movie starring Donald Sutherland in which he totally hangs dong. It is a bonkers movie and very, very highly influential. It's one of those things where if you read the Wikipedia page and there's just like a whole section of how influential it was. Oh, wow. It's one of those like, don't really read anything about it because sure. where it goes is sort of the whole deal. And it will make you appreciate in Bruges more with what they're doing. Hell yeah. That's rad. Yeah. It's like thematically, character-wise appropriate. That's so sick. Yeah, in Bruges. And then also, quick shout-out, I won't get into it, but uh, Blood Red Sky, if you like campy action, whew, I could talk forever about that, but I want to hear Brian. So mine, it's a lot like in Bruges, which it starts out kind of light and fun, then gets really, really dark and awful. It's the 2010 DS game, Mario versus Donkey Kong, Miniland Mayhem. <laughs> okay. Never All played right. it. We'd love to hear about it. You know what? It's fucking great. I haven't pulled out the DS in a long time. And I remember loving this game when it came out. It's a little like a lemming style thing. Yeah, You just yeah. set them on their thing and then they have to get them out the door in a certain order and blah, 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 blah. It's mostly stylus driven on the DS. And it's just cute and fun. It's kind of a puzzle game, but they're really easy. But it's just challenging enough to require a tiny bit of thought. It's great. It's just pure pop goodness. I was playing it yesterday and the day before while listening to podcasts. And it was just one of the most relaxing things I've done in a long time. I haven't played anything else in this series, the Mario versus Donkey Kong games, but it's fun and it's cute. And now Audrey is playing it too by Aww. herself and because she loves like little puzzle games like that. And it's just easy enough that a seven-year-old can do it. As I've been doing like DS emulator stuff, just the DS is such a cool idea. It was so fun as a kid. And I still think it's awesome the way that the games utilize two screens. And it's, yep. mm -hmm. it's so cute. It feels good to hold. You get your stupid little dinky stylus that I lost <laughs> repeatedly as a child. Yeah, I love playing games on the DS. I never played it that much. This was like the game I played the most. Rachel used to play all the Professor Layton games and, and all that. You know, they have a bunch of the Zelda games on it that you can't get on other platforms right now. So we have a bunch of those, but yeah. Anyway, that's it for me. Mario versus Donkey Kong, Miniland Mayhem. Powerful. Love it. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. So that's what's popping. Now we move into our final segment, which is called Peaches and Lemons, which is three part gratitude exercise and one part petty grousing. And the theme song that has been the same for the entire length of the show and that we always add in post goes right here. Peaches and Lemons. That was it. Bam. All right. Who has a lemon, which is a thing that is a mild bummer or annoyance or whatever? I'll go quickly here. My lemon is that, so as I've discussed on the show for a long time, I was only drinking coffee on the weekends in an effort to cut down my caffeine intake. And now I'm drinking coffee again every day. I went on a trip to Toronto and I don't want to be drinking coffee every day, but I also love it, but I also don't want to be doing it, but I also love it but I also don't want to be doing it. But it's so good when you wake up in the morning and you know that you get to have a coffee. But it's so good when you wake up in the so morning. <laughs> That's when I drink coffee. And I'm not going to stop I'm going on another little trip soon, which I'll talk about in a moment. So I'm not stopping anytime soon. And then Thanksgiving's coming up, so you can't stop drinking coffee for Thanksgiving. And then Christmas is coming, so you really can't stop in the interim because then you wouldn't be drinking coffee at Christmas. But then it's almost New Year's. Yeah. Because like winter coffee with Christmas, it's great. And then you're starting a new year and you're like, I don't know, fuck it. What if I just drank coffee all the time now? Yeah. Maybe when we get to the new year, I'll stop again. But for the time being, I am once again a regular coffee drinker. That's my lemon. <laughs> all right. Someone else go. My lemon was the thing that I said earlier about gum. Just that <laughs> if anybody has recommendations for gum that does not lose all flavor in like 10 seconds, I'm open to it. I've been chewing some big red, which I just wish there was some more sustained cinnamon. I will say that the Icebreakers Ice Cubes gum is probably the closest to the good gum experience for me. Yes. But that's the kind of thing where like those first three bites are so good that I just want to like keep shoving them in my mouth which isn't super economical in terms of like, I'm going to eat five pieces of gum to keep the train rolling. And then you get that wad of cud, flavorless cud. Anyway, I understand that the nature of gum is like you chew it until it, there is no flavor left. But I wish that 
there was bitter gum that was magic and suddenly had like a second wind of gumness. So that's my lemon. Well, you know what starts out with no flavor and never gets any is tissues. Oh, no. Did you get some? (laughs) You've seen me on camera the whole time. I haven't gotten any. Well, if you ate some human flesh, such as a foot taco, there could be a Wendigo type situation. Foot you were a little too taco. eager to say like, yeah, I would eat human flesh. So <laughs> let's see, lemon. Now this one's a bit vague, but I also feel like it's one that everyone can relate to. And my lemon is the human body. I've got mm. some notes on this design. <laughs> um, first off, breathy hole and eaty hole. Let's split those up. Yes, smart. <laughs> so one of the things that happened over the past couple months is two friends of mine who are way more into fitness than I am. One of my buddies moved to Austin and now we all live somewhat close to each other. And so my two fitness buddies started working out together at one of their home gyms. And then they offered an invitation to me. I took them up on it. I started working out and it's been great. Like I can lift things that I couldn't lift before and it's really awesome. And then I took like two weeks off and that's just all gone. (laughs) It's yep. just, it is so absolutely soul crushing to be like, oh, I missed two days of exercise. Well, that won't be so bad. I'm dying. Yep. Please help yep, me yep, lift yep. this yep. off my chest. And meanwhile, my body's just like, we got to save this fat. Like, I know we're going to need it any day now. <laughs> Trust me on this, guys. We're going to need this. And when we do, I will laugh. <laughs> so, yeah, human body could be better. Back. I have some notes. Knees click all the time now. How old are you? I'm 31, and I know it ain't going to get better. (laughs) No, I was going to say, yeah, it it just keeps getting better and better. So there's a dip in your early 30s, and then you feel amazing, and all your physical problems are healed, and by the time you're 46 like I am, everything's going great, no complaints at all, top physical form. God, you could lie to me forever. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, sure. I'm sure you guys also get to just like move a joint and then there is a crack in your bones that is like lightning because that happens to me so often and to the point that it like scares my dog. (sighs) It's fun. I'm just a little bag of bones. Your bone cracking noises scare your dog? Well, everything scares my dog. Right. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Same. All right. It's peach time, baby. Yeah. Who's got peaches? I'm going first. Because I had to scramble to write down peaches. One of them I feel like I may have already spoken about on this podcast. So I'm going to say that one first. Did I talk about the Ben and Jerry's cookie dough bites last episode, Brian? I don't think so, but it's also equally possible that you completely did. But I don't think so. All right. My first peach is that Ben and Jerry's, you can buy a bag of the cookie dough pieces that they put in the ice cream. That's the peach. Fuck you for informing me of that. I know. And they make several different, they have like the brownie bite ones and then they have the chocolate chip. I know, that's bad. And also if you have other types of ice cream in your freezer, when you purchase those, you can always just add the cookie dough. Last night in bed with like my remaining cookie dough bites, just drinking it out of the (laughs) bag. Like, I don't need a napkin. I don't need a bowl. Just a romantic, sensual portrait you painted there. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Me, Animal Crossing, 730 hours, guzzling that, that dough, that sweet dough. Hell yeah. God, that's so powerful. Just the aura emanating off of that. I feel motivated by that. My second one related to 730 hours in Animal Crossing or whatever. The DLC is fucking great. The DLC is so good for Animal Crossing New Horizons. And just what a treat. Because I'm nuts and have no impulse control, I quote unquote finished the DLC already, which (gasps) involves doing like... Wow. 30 to 35 vacation home designs. Oh my God. Whoa. And folks, yeah. at the end of the DLC, I'm not saying what it is. I'm just saying that I was like screaming with laughter and joy uh, at the event that happens at the end of it and the things that you can learn how to do. It's pretty tight. Just me running around howling. I haven't pulled the trigger on buying the Happy Home stuff, but I have dipped back in since the latest update. That and Death Stranding are my current like Zen games right now. Very similar games. I'm redoing my whole island though, because like right before nice. I stopped playing, my friends and I, at like the peak of like early pandemic Animal Crossing hype, we had so many bells and things that we started doing weekly photo competitions. Oh my God. <laughs> and we would submit them and then everyone would vote anonymously. 
And like the last one that I did, the theme was post-apocalypse. And so I came back to my island and there was just this barren wasteland with blood stains and skulls and things everywhere. <laughs> and I was wearing like this Mad Max, like BDSM outfit. <laughs> I was like, oh, things have changed. That's awesome. I'll say that the DLC is worth it for the items you can get alone, notwithstanding just like the decorating and all the other stuff that you can get. But you know, the bit of it is that an animal will be like, I want a vacation home that has lots of peaches in it. And then you make them a thing with a lot of peaches and you get to expand your like furniture catalog that you can use. You can add like soundscapes to the homes and stuff. So if you want like rain or accent walls. Anyway, but my bit in blazing through these, which I truly did not intend to do, theoretically, you can just keep going. Like it's an infinite, you can do whatever. So I don't really care. But there was one squirrel that was like, I want a home where I can show my friends about traffic safety. And so I made a really gnarly car accident home because they totally, (laughs) they added a ton of, like you can have cars now, but they have like a mannequin furniture item that just looks like a dead guy that I have been getting so much mileage out of. It's a real (laughs) crash type situation. Yeah. You know, I should have made it more erotic so as to pay homage to Crash 1996 shit. Yes. Anyway, that was my second one. And then my third one is that Brian texted me this morning saying that I was receiving a package, a mysterious package, because I had texted him like last week, hey, can I borrow this thing that you've spoken about a lot? And so Brian just sent me a copy of Tom Sharpling's book that the moment this ends, I'm running out to my balcony and I'm going to read the thing. So thank you, Brian. That is wonderful. I'm very excited to read it. You're welcome. Enjoy it. It's a great book and I think you're going to like it. This is a star-studded back of this. We got some Mark Maron, we got some Patton Oswalt, Rebecca Sugar, John Oliver. Hell yeah. Yep. He's very well-respected in the comedy world. As he should be, with his weird little laugh. Yeah. <laughs> Someone else. Uh, Miles, what you got? First Peach goes out to movie nights. I had two recently. One had some folks over. We played through the most recent Supermassive Games, Dark Pictures anthology, House of Ashes. It's the same folks that made Until Dawn where it's essentially like a campy horror movie where you get to take turns controlling different members of the cast. So before the game even starts, it's like, all right, Steve, you're going to play Chad. I'll play Stacy. Ellie's going to play Rebecca. And so from scene to scene, it'll be like, Steve, it's time to assume your role. Hmm. And so it's just like a choose your own adventure, campy horror story, four to six hours long. The screams and the laughter, it's amazing. And then I caught up with a writing friend of mine and we watched... I mentioned it earlier, I'm going to use this to sneak another recommendation, Blood Red Sky. The lightest synopsis I can give is a vampire on a plane that gets hijacked. It's like campy vampire die hard. And it's great. I've heard of this. Yeah, yeah. It's just fun. And it is like a textbook example of like how to best utilize complications in unique areas and it constantly escalates in ways that you're just like oh we're doing this now okay so yeah like just movie nights i fucking love movie nights they're the best cool second peach i'm going to be in england for pretty much all of december (gasps) visiting my partner's family and just like going around the country and going to bruges because after we watched it i was like baby could we go to bruges and she was like yes so we rented a place that's like seven minute walk from like the clock tower and the courtyard and all that stuff from the movie this is the best time to go to england christmas in the uk is the fucking best it's exactly what you want it to be like there's little christmas markets you can do the set meals at the restaurants and they give you christmas crackers at the end it is my favorite time of year over there we never spent an actual christmas holiday there but you know when we lived there it was like oh i just love this time of year you know december basically in england you picked a good time to go you're gonna have a great time i'm so excited yeah we got tickets like months ago when it was still unsure if borders were going to be open. So they, we got them cheap. So we're just going to like, yeah, just go and do all that. Have a great time. Thanks, man. Yeah, no, it's going to be amazing. My third peach. And again, this is just like a very personal one for me, but I have a job interview with a game studio tomorrow that I really, really admire. And I'm really excited about it. And I don't know how it'll go. Maybe I won't get it, but it's just like one of those times where it's like, cool. They like the thing that I sent in. They want to talk. I've been just doing gigs pretty much since the last time that we spoke and doing more voice acting stuff. And that's all been well and good. But like, I kind of hate working for myself. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I like when someone's like, hey, can you help me with this? And I'm like, yes, I would love to do that for you. I'm very much externally motivated that way. So I'm just excited to like 
get back to working with the team. And maybe this will lead to that. Maybe it won't. But it's an exciting thing that's happening tomorrow. So yeah, that's awesome. Congrats, dude. Congratulations. Dude. I hope it goes great. Thanks, dude. Mm-hmm. All right, Brian. Okay, peach number one. So I booted up my relatively new computer yesterday. For those of you out there who aren't tech heads, booted up means turned on. And <laughs> the monitor, like the resolution, it was in a super low resolution. And I was like, what the fuck is going on with this? I bought for my first time an ultra wide monitor. Ooh. And I've been trying it out. It's been working great. I've had this computer for about a month now. Awesome. No problems. Turn it on yesterday. Resolution's completely shot to shit. And I'm like, fuck. It's one of the apples with the new M1 chip. I was like, is this an M1 thing? Blah, blah, blah. Looked for, you know, a bunch of different ways to solve it. And I was like, wait a minute. What if it's just the cable? I swapped out HDMI cables and it fucking worked. Oh, it's the best feeling. Hell yeah. Tech problem solved. And like, I'm reading all these things which are like, you got to download this resolution shifter. And I was like, no, it's been working. Why? Why did it change? And it just plain fucking worked. Amazing. And oh, I was so happy about that. That's peach number one. Peach number two is I went to the DMV on Monday with an appointment to get my real ID. (gasps) Oh, shit. It's getting to be real ID season. And I was like, here we fucking go. I was in and out the door within 20 minutes. Ooh, that feels good. Whoa. You know the thing where you wait in the line to get your number first? That's the first thing, and then they call it. Hmm. So that line was about 10 minutes to get the number. As soon as they give me the number, I walk away, and they call it. Like, while I'm walking away from the counter, they call the number, and I show up. And I've heard all these things about, you know, DMV people being annoying with the real ID stuff. This lady could not have been more lovely. She looked over all the documents I gave her. I had everything in order. No hassles at all. She even gave me a little tip about, oh, here's your interim license and blah, blah, blah. Like, took the picture, bam, out, done. Best DMV experience I've ever had. Everyone was kind, no mask assholes. Like, everyone was masked and it was all great. So a really lovely DMV experience. Did you make an appointment before you went? I did, and I'm very glad I did, although I'm not quite sure that would have made any difference because the line was pretty short, but yeah. Hell yeah. My final peach is that Audrey is really into chess right now, (sighs) and I believe I've talked about this on the show before, uh, but I don't know, and I've been playing with her kind of every night after dinner, and she is the master of psychological manipulation because (laughs) what we do, whenever it's my turn, She does this. I've had to tell her to stop and she never stops. She goes, what are you going to do? 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 And I'm like, honey, I'm trying to think. What are you going to do? You want to take my rook? You want to take a queen? What are you going to do? And I'm like, honey, please stop singing at me. I'm trying to think. Uh, And it's very, very cute. Like she's thinking moves ahead. She's not just responding immediately to the situation. She's like, if you do this, then I'm going to do that and blah, blah, blah. She beat me a couple times, which is Whoa. pretty great. I mean, asterisk, just so you don't think I'm a complete moron. That's with plenty of do overs and blah, 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 blah. Uh, sound like excuses to me, but okay. Yeah. She genuinely got me. She snuck up on me one time. And I love that my little kid is, she's becoming an adult. Like she's thinking, and this is a level of cognition that is unthinkable from like a five-year-old. But now that she's seven, it's like, it's a thing. And I love it. That's amazing, man. Yeah. Do you have like a cute chess set? No, we just have a normal, like it's a real shitty one we just got. Okay, Audrey Christmas present pitch from me. Can I get her a really cute chess set? Are you kidding? She would love that. Okay, fuck yes. All right, I'm going to do that. That's a great idea. The other thing that I learned from playing chess with my daughter is that all the pieces have these rich inner lives that I didn't know about. (gasps) And there's lore. The queen and the bishop are like talking to each other about rainbows or whatever. And the pawns are having a little dance party. And there's a lot of social drama happening between the pieces that, you know, you're not aware of until you play with someone with an overactive imagination, (laughs) which is very, very cute. This is how I know I'm raising a gamer. She also refers to her pieces as her inventory. (laughs) Oh my God. She told me I'm protecting my inventory the other day. A gamer or a future warlord? I know, right? (laughs) That's so cool, man. So those are my three peaches. Okay, great. Hold on one second. I'll be right back. (gasps) If 
Yeah, is that he son tissues? of a bitch comes back with the tissue. He's totally getting tissues. Yeah. Is he holding it? I'm is he holding at his it? Hands. I'm looking at his hands. I'm looking at his hands. Hi. All smiles, Brian. What's up? Well, I just got a little snack in the kitchen. Uh huh. Some delicious tissues. That is a balled up tissue in your hand. It sure Look is. Look at that. It's it really nice is. and clean. There's two of them. I was going to say, that's a lot of tissue. That's double the tissue. They look very clean. Oh, look at the lighting change. Oh, hey, you know what? Emerge from Hold behind on. the tissue. Yes, what? Uh-oh. Oh, no. Layton, do you have anywhere you need to be? I would do this if I had tissues, but I only have toilet paper. What, what do you have there, Miles? We talked about how, like, I'll show up for food. I like a culinary experience. Yeah. I want to do this with you and just see what it's like. I want to see the world through your eyes. Okay, I love that. First of all, we're not swallowing. Just to be very clear on this, we're not swallowing. We're just going to chow down on this. Hold on, I want to participate. I okay. don't have tissues, but I'm going to go get some paper towel. I'll be right back. Hold oh, on. Wow. Do toilet paper, toilet paper, toilet paper. Yeah, toilet paper. Layton. God, I oh, hope she no. heard us. I hope oh. she heard us. Oh, she's in for a world of hurt if she goes with a paper <laughs> that's, towel. That's bad. What we have are like the corn kernels, and if she gets a paper towel, she's just eating the cob. Oh, did you hear us as we were shouting at you as you walked no. away? No. Toilet paper. Toilet paper. I'm not doing toilet paper because it's sitting in my bathroom next to my toilet. I'm not going to do that. All right. Okay. If that's where you keep your toilet paper, that's just ridiculous. Open a fresh <laughs> roll. Crack open a cold one. <laughs> it's for the pod. Let's chug some Charmin. <laughs> You're getting paper towel and that's right. what's happening. I'm well, sorry. Well, no, I like this. Now we have an interesting variable in this experiment. Yeah, that's right. Now, I haven't done this in 30 years. So you just it's a tissue. You know, it's a little politician. Now, we just chew on it. It's just a thing to chew on. It's not a thing to swallow. All at once. What, you can take bites out of it? I don't know, bud. Hey, you're the expert on this matter. No, we just pop it in our mouths and just like, I remember sticking it in my cheek and just kind of... I'm already salivating so much <laughs> in like anticipation of this. Jesus Christ. Yeah, well, I haven't eaten yet either. And nothing says yum, 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 like a wadded up piece of thin paper. All right. Cheers, everybody. Here we go. Cheers to the camera. Cheers. And pop them, baby. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. It's immediately denser than I was expecting. This is not as good as I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I definitely hate this. I'm getting notes of um, dry. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> dry. Yeah. The paper towel is. Uh... Why did I ever do this? I do feel like, though, like the, the young teenage boy in me is like, Oh, I could hit someone with the gnarliest <laughs> spit water right now. Hell yeah. Truly, yeah. Like the WMD of spit wads. I didn't plan to like spit this out into anything. <laughs> so now. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like some of us brought an extra tissue. I had to bail. I had to pull the ripcord on that. Uh, I'm keeping my end. Uh, well, Miles, thank you so much for, well, why is my speech muffled? Thank you so much for joining us today. As always, it was a joy. And it's just great to talk to you again. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. It's so great seeing both of you. Thank you for introducing me to this delicacy of yours. Mm -hmm. Miles, where can people find you online? Do you have anything you want to plug, et cetera? You can find me pretty much everywhere at the Miles Luna on Twitter. Oh, I've been a little busier these days, but I did start streaming on Twitch, primarily for different charitable organizations. The thing I'm most proud of, and I did save it under the VODs if you want to watch it, I played Death Stranding for the first time while walking on a treadmill, and it was incredible. Mm. I walked 70 miles over the course of five days. 70 miles? What? Yeah, I, I walked 70 miles. I was playing it for the very first time, had an absolute blast. And yeah, all that stuff is up on my Twitch channel if you want to watch that. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, folks at home. As always, thank you for being here. Thanks for listening. I hope you're feeling flirty, fun, and fresh, and that um, No Nut November is a phrase that isn't in your vocabulary or your physical vocabulary. As always, stay safe, come hard. Uh, see ya. That's the end of the podcast. Well, sorry, I do have a quick PSA for the end here. Right. People don't eat tissues. They're not good for you. They don't <laughs> taste good. It's not a pleasurable experience. I've had this one in my mouth for a few minutes now, and it's not really working out the way I had hoped. So don't eat tissues. Eat food. Thank you. <clears throat> Late Night is produced by Brian Wecht, Leighton Gray, and Jarek Centeno. Follow us on Twitter at Leighton Night, on Instagram at Leighton underscore night, or email us at LeightonKnight at gmail.com. <laughs>